Hello, everyone. Welcome to the State Department. I have a couple things at the top. So first, um, you may have seen reports from the Pentagon. U.S. Special, Force, uh, Special Operation Forces partnered with Afghan National Defense and Security Forces today in a counterterrorism operation in Patika Province, Afghanistan. The raid resulted in the successful recovery of Ali Hader Jalani, the son of Pakistan's former Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Jalani, who had been held hostage since May 2013. Senior officials have been in contact with Afghan and Pakistani authorities on the operation, as well as on the repatriation of Mr. Jalani. This raid demonstrates the growing capabilities and effectiveness of the Afghan security forces and is an excellent example of the strong security and intelligence partnership between Afghan and U.S. forces in counterterrorism operations against the remnants of Al Qaeda. Working alongside our Afghan partners, we'll continue to make clear there's no safe haven for terrorists in Afghanistan. Next, I mentioned this yesterday, but we'd like to say it again. The United States commends the Philippines on its May 9th elections, which by all major accounts appears to have gone smoothly and enjoyed historically high levels of participation. We're still awaiting the official results, but we look forward to congratulating and working with the winners on our active and close bilateral relationship. Was there some particular reason you decided to repeat what you said yesterday? So uh, the uh, several of the presidential candidates um, uh, noted that a winner has has been unofficially named. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so the unofficial winner. Yeah. Um, are there? Do you have any concerns about uh, about this guy? He's got somewhat of a. So uh, as, allegations of somewhat of a checkered past. So as stated, we look forward to working and uh, congratulating the winner. Washington respects the choice of the Philippines people. We gladly work with the leader they've selected. Okay. So there are no no concerns about this this we, guy. We look forward to congratulating, welcoming, and working with him. So there are no concerns about this guy. So we look forward to working with them. Are there any concerns about this At case? this stage, we will work with the people, or the individual that the Filipinos have elected. Uh, are we talking about the, the, the same guy? Yes. The uh, Rodrigo Duterte? Yes. Okay. And um, and as, as uh, Matt said, you're, there's no concerns ab about this, uh, about working with him specifically, even though documents do show that uh, So we respect the choice of, of the Philippines. Even if, even if he has a, a pretty colorful, uh, offensive language, he has insulted the pop, for example. The U.S. has no, as Matt pointed out, has no you know, concern. We, we've spoken about rhetoric around the world, and not specifically in this case. We look forward to working with the leader that the Philippines has elected. And he said also, he said also on the South China Sea, uh, he said also that he wants to have a constructive relationship with China and maybe a direct dialogue. So with we, China, do you, do you, do you yeah, have any comments? So we've comment? seen those comments. You know, the United States has consistently expressed support for nations to exercise peaceful means to resolve territorial or maritime disputes without the use of force, intimidation, or coercion. So um, we expect the official results from the Philippines to come out soon. We look forward to working with the people they elected. Matt? Uh, oh. Um, well, I just ha I have two logistical things. Sure. They can wait until the end. Um, we so can do whatever you need. Iran. Yeah. Um, you will have seen probably that they say that they have taken delivery of the S three hundred. Yep. Did you guys ever decide whether this was something that was um, destabilizing or um, destabilizing to the region that would that would uh, trigger uh, more sanctions? So we're aware of reports of progress towards the delivery by Russia of the S-300 defensive missile system. We've been making clear our objections to any sale of the S-300 missile system for quite a while. Secretary has raised it with Foreign Minister Lavrov repeatedly. Uh, we've long objected to the sale of such sophisticated defense capabilities. We continue to monitor it closely. And while we're opposed to the sale, it's not a violation of the JCPOA or UN Security Council Resolution 2231. No, it's not. But it is. Po it, but it is. If you determine that it um, is de destabilizing, uh, provocative, uh, it, you are able to impose sanctions <clears throat> uh, because of it. And the last we checked, 
um, you guys were in the process of responding to letter from the Hill mm -hmm. about whether or not this met that standard. So yeah, I'm not going to get ahead of those sanctions discussions now, um, but but well, I do is take your point. You still going on? Have you responded? I have. To the I have no update on that. I'll check in on the status of the letter. And then the uh, other thing on Iran is that in uh, Syria today, there um, some of these uh, Iranians who were the IRGC um, troops who were taken captive, um, see more of them have been killed, it looks like. And um, there's a question about whether – about who who is holding them. Do you ha have any insight? I, d I don't. I have nothing to confirm there. No. Um, are we good on cereal? Yep. Okay, you know what? Let me go to Iran quick. I just want to follow up on this. Sure. 300. You said it's, they are, it's a defensive weapon, correct? Yes. So why in principle would the United States It's a sophisticated military piece of apparatus. It, it we is, have concerns. Yeah, but it, does, it cannot be re-equipped to be used defensively, could it? So our so concerns they're, they're actually, are they, on, they will use them if they are attacked, right? You know, I'm not going to talk about how they could use them. We've made our concerns known for quite some time on this specific piece of military equipment. It's very sophisticated military equipment. Um, our position on the S-300 and that sale has not changed. So there's always the fear that they can use that technology. They I'm can take that technology and use it offensively. I'm going to I'm going to leave that our concerns are there. Laura, you had a question on Iran. Hakmati filed a complaint against the government of Iran, of Iran in a federal court um, about the conditions of his imprisonment. Um, I guess, first of all, what's your reaction to this complaint, and does he have a right to sue the Iranian government? Okay, so we're aware of the media reports around this lawsuit. U.S. government is not a party to this private civil action, and we have no comment on the case. But just generally speaking, I have to leave it there. Condition <coughs> the lawsuit be filed. Are you concerned about? Possible retribution lawsuits. I'm going to leave the US. that there. Okay. So you take the question about whether or not the administration is going to take. I realize you have not yet, but um, about the sanctions. Well, because in the U the U.S. the federal government has intervened in previous <laughs> similar cases in the past, uh, and there was one case involving the Palestinians. Where the oh, Department and the of civil Justice, action. yeah, Department of I Justice. I can check with that, and, and if we have any update and, and opposed. Yeah. So I, I can check on that, but but I think we'll stay where we are on that. Yeah. Say it. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask you the Syria, uh, Syrian government issued a statement, or it's attributed to them that the situation in Aleppo, that the tensions in Aleppo have been really reduced, and the situation has de-escalated. That it gives hope, you know, for the, the current pause, for it to continue. Uh, is, that, is that your feeling? Are you advocating for that? Are you pushing for that, for the, you know, for the cessation to continue, uh, you know, for so we, week? So we spoke or? about this um, a little bit yesterday, but I appreciate the question. I'm not going to speak to the Syrian government's exact statement, you know, but, you but let's – Come down so like. what we've seen is, is you know, the cessation is not uniformly, not 100 um, percent, has reduced violence, as we've seen. Our view on a cessation of hostilities, it, it is a fundamentally good thing, of course. It, you know, it alleviates, though it doesn't remove some of the suffering of the Syrian people. You know, any reduction in violence is good. Again, I, I can't confirm, you know, that – that all reduction or all violence has been stemmed. We see these periodic reports, um, but you know, a cessation of hostilities. Our goal is that it's open-ended. Our goal is that it's nationwide, um, because that creates the political space where we can continue to have these conversations under Demistura and actually seek that political transition. Now, let me ask you conversely, uh, <coughs> considering or in light of the statements made by Ayman Zawahi, who repeated statements, the head of Al Qaeda. Uh, are you concerned that this pause in fighting might give Al Qaeda a push to sort of uh, regroup and, and reattack? No, because what what we're concerned is that this fighting creates the sort of ungoverned spaces in which terrorists breed and which terrorism spread. So the political transition in a stable Syria is in the best interest of all of us. Mm -hmm. And, and finally, so what is the next step in terms of the talks that are ongoing? Do we have so yeah. I, I think you saw Secretary Kerry said today that the ISSG will meet May 17th in Vienna. He will co-host with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov this meeting to reaffirm and strengthen the nationwide cessation of hostilities throughout Syria 
He'll discuss the tangible steps the ISSG can support and take to ensure full, unimpeded, and sustained humanitarian access throughout the country, especially in the besieged and hard-to-reach areas. And he'll advance discussions between the Syrian parties on a genuine political transition in accordance with the Geneva Communique. So yesterday on at length, some length, about the joint U.S.-Russia statement, yeah. which you said that the administration's position was that this statement reaffirmed the entire cease the, the nationwide yeah. cessation of hostilities, and there was no longer then any need for these uh, localized extensions or extensions of localized cessations of hostilities. Um, like an hour after we finished this, mm -hmm. uh, that conversation, the Syrian government announced a 48-hour extension of the localized Aleppo cessation. So I'm wondering, does that mean that um, your interpretation of this joint statement is wrong, or does it mean that the Russians and the Syrians had a different interpretation of it? What, I, what, I would what, what say that mean? we stand behind our, our um, statement yesterday, co-signed by the Russians, co-released by the Russians, which is an open-ended reaffirmation of the cessation of hostilities. As we talked about yesterday, some of these um, small sort of area-limited, time-limited cessation of hostilities continue to be confidence-building measures. Our reaffirmation is that the cessation of hostilities is open-ended. It's national. Yep, but that it's said, not. so so that said, you know, as you I said, can't just pretend that it no, but in, 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 like indefinitely I, across the country when the Syrians who are actually on the ground doing the fighting yeah. with the Russians are are doing it piecemeal yeah. and in in uh, and in time limited durations. Yeah. So our commitment, like I said, is that it is open-ended. That's what the Russians no, signed up to as well, Matt. It is not. Well, so when you see these small, like, 48-hour, 24-hour cessation of hostilities, you know, as I said, so our cessation of hostilities, what we said yesterday in the statement, open-ended nationwide. Know, these small ones, these, the you know. The reality is that, that And the, the reality is there is violence on the ground. I know, but the reality is not I, – I'm talking about in terms of the cessation of hostilities. You say it's one thing and insist that that's what it is, when it's not, because the people who are doing the fighting, the Syrian government, mm -hmm. are doing it piecemeal and in short durations. So you know, we, we talked about this some yesterday, these small confidence-building measures, you know, released so you our, our – so, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. You don't, you don't see the localized 48-hour extension that the Syrians announced yesterday as being in contradiction in, to no, the joint I statement? Don't. All right. Thank you. Any more on Syria? Can you tell me about um, the discussion um, the Secretary had with Lavrov? Okay, I, I can confirm that they did have a call. It's my understanding. It was um, a logistical call. It's one of the, the calls that the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov have had frequently in the last couple of weeks, but I, I don't have anything more to read out on that. There was nothing about uh, um, the Short -term open -ended. <laughs> No, but, but I think our statement, you know, which is very clear yesterday, you know, and was agreed to and, and co-released by the Russians, speaks to that. Syria? Did the Hunter of Peace people have aid so can make logistical calls? I'm sorry? Why do two ministers level people make a logistical call? I think, I think it talks to the importance that both these countries and the commitment that we have to ensuring, you know, the political transition and the cessation. We have these calls. Syria? Yes. Yeah. So with the small 48, 24 hour, 72 hour extensions, so the one that was announced by the government yesterday, that's set to expire at midnight Thursday, so 12.01 a.m. Syria time Thursday. Um, what's the current plan? Um, is there any is Our there any current plan like we spoke well, to? I mean, is, there, is there any efforts to, to extend that further, or is the government just going to say? Well, well, it was Thursday the Syrian government on. who announced it. Our position, as well as the Russian position, open-ended countrywide. We will continue to make the case for that. It doesn't say that there's not violence. It doesn't say that there are these areas where where there's conflict that flares up. I mean, as of now, the Syrian government can just, I mean, will fiat that it, it, the ceasefire is not on it on well, Thursday. You know, and we expect, and we have, we have had the Russians recommit to their influence, and we see that that influence has worked in the past. What does this mean, Elizabeth, that the U.S. and Russia decide and the opposition and the Syrian regime should <laughs> imply? No, I think what it says is that a cessation of hostilities is best for the people of Syria.
you know, and, and this is this is the understanding we have seen, you know, speaking specifically, like I just mentioned, that the Russians do have influence, that cessation of hostilities in the past has worked. You know, just because we see these flares or we see these piecemeal approach doesn't mean that we are backing off our commitment to make it open-ended and nationwide. Okay. Are we done with Syria? Okay. China, the South China Sea, uh, in yep. regards to the most recent uh, freedom of navigation um, exercises, the Chinese government uh, said that the, the ships entered the water illegally and that this was a threat to peace and stability in the region. Do you have a response to that? Sure. Um, so I've got a bit, so bear with me. The Department of Defense conducted a freedom of navigation operation in the South China Sea, specifically in the region of Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratly Islands to uphold the rights and freedoms of all states under international law and to challenge excessive maritime claims of some claimants in the South China Sea. These excessive maritime claims are inconsistent with international law as reflected in the Law of the Sea Covenant in that they purport to restrict the navigational rights that the United States and all states are entitled to exercise. During this operation, a U.S. Navy surface ship exercised the right of innocent passage while transiting inside 12 nautical miles of Fiery Cross Reef, a high tide feature that is occupied by China, but also claimed by the Philippines, Taiwan, and Vietnam. No claimants were notified prior to the transit, which is also consistent with our normal process in international law. This operation challenged attempts by China, Taiwan, and Vietnam to restrict navigational rights around the features they claim, specifically that these three claimants purport to require prior permission or notification of transits through the territorial sea, contrary to international law. Because the Philippines maritime claims in relation to South China Sea features do not purport to restrict the exercise of navigational rights and freedoms under the law of the sea by the United States and others, they were not challenged during this operation. And you had a specific question on China. And so uh, do you have a response to the Chinese claims yeah, well, that they this, were This operation was not singling out China. <laughs> the operation um, challenged maritime claims of China, Taiwan, and Vietnam. Um, of course. determines what is an excessive maritime claim? Well, who determines excessive? So it is, there's, it is consistent with the um, law of the sea. It's the international um, understanding of what innocent passage is. The United States is not a party to the UNCLOS. Isn't that correct? So we have conducted freedom of navigations. Well, yeah. So for, for the, so it's. Do China, Taiwan, and the Philippines say that their own claims are excessive? It seems to me that you have just decided that uh, that they're excessive because uh, under the terms of a treaty to which you're not a party. So they have <coughs> asserted requirements for vessels transiting, and it is inconsistent with international law of the sea. The U.S. operation, um, our freedom of navigation, challenges that as these signatories. So, yeah, so. But you didn't, you, but you ignored them. Basically, you just, this ship just barged in with, <coughs> without. Consistent with international. Yeah, yeah. Time. But, but I mean, you didn't notify anybody. No, we you just, you just went in. Them. But my, that's my, now, my question is, who decides whether it, a claim is excessive? So it's, it's, it is the international law of the sea. It's my understanding that you're, determines you're this. A party to the international law. But this is a common understanding among these claimants. Well, do they say that their, uh, their own claims are excessive? So there's three nations yeah. that have, uh, have nations done careful, that. One of yeah, thank Taiwan. you. Three, well, and the Philippines, as well as Taiwan, um, that have said claims uh, to this um, feature in the South China Sea, yeah, in the Spratly Lions. Do any of them accept your, your, your saying that, they, that their, their claim is excessive? So we were operating in accordance with international maritime law. Well, would any of them agree with you that their own claims are excessive? I would ask them well, on they that. Don't, but I don't know. Okay. Um, oh, and then, no, that's it. Okay. That. Well, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, does one not see this as a, um, as prodding China? I know you say here that um, the operation was not signaling out China, but no. it is close to a reef that China 
claims as its own. No, we don't believe these are provocative at all. Around the world, we conduct freedom of navigations in accordance with international law. But as one, one doesn't um, uh, sail close to this specific reef or any of those others. Um, no, we don't. We don't see this as singling out any any um, country. We don't single. Uh, we don't view this as provocative at all. Anything else on the South China Sea? Say it. Of course. Okay. I know you talked about the uh, talks yesterday. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you about the, apparently, the contingent, the American Special Forces contingent that went to, into to Yemen and mm -hmm. to Mokala. Yeah. Is, that, is that part of a, like, grander plan to bring about stability? So, no, this was so limited support. So, the Department of Defense has actually spoken to this. U.S. Central Command provided limited support to an anti uh, Al Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula operation. Uh, led by Yemeni, Saudi, and Emirati forces in and around Makala. Um, you know, we remain concerned about AQAP, um, and we welcome the operations taken by the Yemeni forces with the support of the Emirati and the Saudi forces to address this. It was limited. Right. You know, uh, as far as the, uh, the Al-Qaeda and, and the Arabian Peninsula is concerned, it was really one of the showcases of this administration because they basically decimated uh, Al Qaeda and, and the Arabian Peninsula, but then this war brought them back. Mm -hmm. You know, by and large, due to this, to the war that is being waged by Saudi Arabia and others. You know, so Al Qaeda like a, has taken kind of advantage of the instability in Yemen. You know, this was an operation, and and again, we thank the Saudis and the Emiratis as well as the Yemenis. Um, for for um, moving forward on this operation. And lastly, today they exchanged the, the, the fighting forces exchanged prisoners and so mm -hmm. on. You see this as a step forward along. You know, we region? see. We, we've we've spoken about this before. You know, all the steps forward that lead to um, you know the full because the peace talks are ongoing, lead to a successful resolution of that. We do welcome it. Yep. Uh, many believe that the Saudis' year-long campaign in Yemen has created a power vacuum which al-Qaeda took advantage of, and the U.S. supported that intervention. Are we now seeing a situation where the U.S. contributed to the power vacuum and is now fighting the consequences? I, I think what you see is instability caused in Yemen by, you know, the war that was happening here. You see um, certainly the Saudis, as well as um, other Arab coalition partners, seeking to address that. This goes back to what we were talking about in Syria. When you have conflict and you have ungoverned spaces, that's where instability and terrorism breed. Would you say that the, the Saudi uh, bombing campaign did not dramatically expend the power vacuum in Yemen? What I would say is that, you know, we, um, the Saudis and the Arab coalition who came in at the invitation of the Yemeni government are working to reduce the ungoverned the space. Result. I'm sorry? The result. Has it reduced the ungoverned space? Well, what you see in operations like what happened in McCullough is you see some of that ungoverned space being chipped back. And let's also remember where we're going on this, which is the UN-led peace talks, where you're looking at a real political solution to this. But, you know, ungoverned spaces do breed terror. Does the U.S. still support the Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen? We support the um, we support the Saudi Arab coalition. Yeah. Uh, Pat, yeah. yeah. I'm the sorry. US. We're going to move on. Thank you. Jonathan, from Air News TV. Uh, U.S. Special Forces in Afghanistan today rescued Ali Hadar Gilani, uh, the son of former Prime Minister uh, Yusuf Hadar Gilani. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us the details of that operation? Okay, so actually I spoke about this at the top. It's fine. So so I'll leave that there, but if you have questions on operations, I'm going to Who are the kidnap kidnappers? I'm so I'm going to refer you to the Department of Defense if you have questions on the exact um, operational details. Okay, secondly, it's about the question of the uh, a political party, MQM, in Pakistan. Uh, they have announced here in Washington that they submitted a paper, a memorandum with the uh, with the office of the Richard Olson, uh, alleged Of, of Asra? Yes and alleged that Pakistani military uh, killing their workers and uh, can you share the details of that letter with us? We've not received that letter. You haven't? Received. We have not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, quick. It's uh, North Korea. Uh, North Korea leader Kim Jong-un uh, suggested uh, peace treaty talk with the United States. Uh, what is the U.S. In, uh, consider about the uh, suggestion? So, on the peace treaty, our, our position 
and the position of the international community is clear. So we will not accept the DPRK as a nuclear state. You know, we, we have made very clear on this. Um, we are open to authentic and credible negotiations to implement the September 20, 2005 joint statement and bring North Korea into compliance with all applicable Security Council resolutions. However, the onus is on North Korea, as it has long been, to take meaningful action to verifiable denuclearization and refrain from um, any rhetoric or, or provocative activity. So that's where we're focused, denuclearization. But the Chinese government the pressure to the United States about between U.S. and North Korea and China, in the future they would like to talk with peace treaty talks. So would you be a uh, U.S. consider about what the Chinese pressure to this issue? Again, our focus is on verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. All right, thank, you. thank you, sir. Um, on Japan, uh, President Obama announced that he will be visiting Hiroshima earlier today. Um, are you in contact with your Japanese counterparts uh, to discuss sort of the logistical As details? As it's a, a presidential visit, I'm going to refer you to the White House. But thank you. Okay, no. Matt. Uh, yesterday, in its court submission, yep. uh, the RNC said that you guys had told them that you would not be producing any of Mr. Pagliano, uh, any more, I guess, of mm -hmm. Mr. Pagliano's emails. Is that is that correct? So thank you for that, because there's been some um, unclear reporting on this. So. The department has searched Mr. Pagliano's email PST file and has not located one that covers the time period of Secretary Clinton's tenure. The absence of this email file, however, does not indicate that the department has no emails sent or received by him. In fact, we have previously produced through FOIA and to Congress emails sent and received by Mr. Pagliano during Secretary Clinton's tenure. Furthermore, at no point did the State Department convey to the RNC that we did not intend to produce responsive emails within our possession consistent with our obligations under the law. Okay, but I mean, are you done? Have you given them everything that they are, should get so, that so, you have? So we continue to take a look at it. We will produce files as we are required under the law. I understand that, but do you know at the moment if you have, if there are emails that you have found from that time period that have just not yet been turned over to? So the department's ongoing conducting a thorough search. I don't have details on that, but at no point did we say to the RNC that we would not produce. All right, and then my, the last one, which is a logistical thing, which is this re the report um, that the. Um, video of a briefing from a couple of years back with um, Jen Saki was edited uh, to remove questions and her answers about uh, when the Iran negotiations began. What, oh yeah, what, what's going on yeah. here? So, so we saw that report. We actually spoke to Fox about this yesterday, so thanks for that question. Um, I'd back up. The, this is a, a daily press briefing from 2013. Uh, the transcript of that daily press briefing and video was always available. Transcript was on state.gov. The video was available on other sites. There was a glitch in the State Department video. Um, when Fox flagged it for us, we actually replaced it with a video from Divids, which is the military repository where a lot of uh, news media gets its video. The whole video was there. Um, and we also annotated it on our YouTube channel. Yeah, but that, I mean, a glitch, uh, this just seems awfully <laughs> strange and coincidental. Yeah. The that transcript this was always could, up, though, and the yeah, video the, existed on, on other, other channels. I, I can't well, speak I, to. If you were looking on the state.gov website and going to try to watch <laughs> that part of the briefing, it wouldn't have been there. So the briefing was there. As I said, the, the yeah, full transcript was there. Several minutes were, yeah. like, missing. No, and so we've, right. we have subbed it out. I, I, I know, but, but, but can you, I, has anyone looking into so it? So we why? are, we're looking into it genuinely. We think it was a glitch. 
So. Uh, I, I mean, are there other briefing videos that are not to our knowledge at all? But you no. know, it's what we're taking a look at is is process. You know, it, we were unaware of it, and as soon as we found out about it, we made sure it was whole. Okay. But is there any indication that you've uh, since you since this was brought to your attention? I guess yesterday. Yeah. yeah? Um, have, have you discovered that the, it was altered at all? Um, I, it's not to my knowledge. There was a missing portion of it. We pulled it from another online source that, I, I that get this. That, but I'm trying yeah. to figure out how exactly the portion. I, was you know what? It's something we're looking into. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a quick one? Sure. Of course. Follow Egypt. What you, yes. Uh, what you said yesterday. Uh, I know you addressed the issue of the sentence. For uh, the Al Jazeera the, for, journalist. Yeah, for Ibrahim Halal and Ala Saplan. And you said that they're sentenced in absentia. Yeah, which that's is our an, understanding. An, an, I think. Uh, and then you said you're concerned. Is that, is that the extent of your concern, or are you going to, let's say, perhaps issue a stronger statement? I mean, considering that uh, basically that was the essence of the Patrick Leahy letter. I mean, you yeah. know, Egypt. It violates human rights, and well, if we are, but if they are violating well, human rights, well, this is rights, a court process, you right. know. So it's so it is actually different. You know, this is something we continue to track. You know, we raise our concerns, you know, on a routine and consistent basis with Egyptian authorities. So we don't take the sentence lightly. We did note that this was apparently the the trial was in absentia, so so the verdict was. I, I'm loath to say automatic, but was was actually part of the process. But we do raise this; we are concerned. Okay, Can I of course. To the transcript, I mean the uh, yeah. video, please. Sure. Yeah, do you, is someone looking into this yeah. to see whether what exactly happened in this case, and also to yeah. make sure that it is not yeah. that there aren't other. Yeah. Uh, videos that it are is. We've we've changed our procedures, and this is so technical. And forgive me for this. We've changed our procedures on that, but we are taking a look at it. You know, certainly, um, you know, transparency and getting information to you guys, not only here in the briefing room, but on the web and searchable, is a priority for us. And so, absolutely. All right. So, so when, when it finds that someone's deliberately cut that section, that person would face disciplinary. You know, I'm not going to get ahead of it. We just found out. We made wrong, it whole. We'll we'll take a look at it. Well, okay. You, uh, when uh, you're done with this event, not you personally, but whoever's looking into it. In my it, free time. <laughs> yes. Um, on weekends. Um, can you uh, let us know what the result yeah, of the investigation is? If there is any is? update, I absolutely will. And, I'm, and I don't want to call it an investigation because that makes it formal. What, I'm, what we're looking at is what happened. Well, exactly. Well, yep. we would like to know what happened, too. So yep. can you let us know when you find out what happened? As and hopefully always. this will be like, you know, not, yeah. not going to take a I, year. Yeah, I, I would characterize it as a glitch. Is public affairs looking into it? Or? Uh, the department is. Okay. Not to my knowledge at all. Thanks, guys. That was alarming.